Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of your favorite YouTube show, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, make sure you hit the like button. Let's get them likes up today. You know, and like I just said, if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do because I promise not to disappoint you. Leave some comments. I definitely like when you guys leave comments. I take all your input, things that you want to see, things that you want to hear about. If I experienced it, I want to bring it to you. And I've made some promises, right, because we've had some Cops on the show that talked about, you know, locking a sock and getting hit with a lock. So I said, hey, I'm going to do a video on prison weapons. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about prison weapons. Because I want people, you know, to see that this is real. You know, all the stuff that you heard about federal prison being camp fed and, you know, people eating steaks and living good, watching cable TV. That stuff's all a farce. 99% of that stuff that you heard about federal prison is a lie. It's not the truth if you heard about it being camp fed. Um, so you might be wondering, you know, how do people make knives in prison? You know, where do they get the steel from or the metal? You know, a lot of times people will cut steel right out of their bed. You know, all the beds are made out of steel. But how do you cut steel in prison? There's different ways, man. You know, they used to have hair clippers in there, so the stainless steel tops of them hair clippers, you can take them and you can just saw right through that steel. It takes a while. A lot of work. A lot of work to, to get a knife out of a bed. And you can just cut that knife all the way down, back and forth, back and forth. And you can cut it right to a point. Then once you get it done, what do you do? You sharpen it with rock. So you're thinking, who the hell is going to walk outside and find a rock and sharpen a piece of steel while there's cops all around and other prisoners? A lot of times you can bring rocks back to your cell. Sometimes the floor of your cell you can sharpen knives right on the floor of your cell. So like, this is a piece of steel, right? This is a, this is a prison knife. So you can get this piece of steel maybe out of a bed. You can get it out of the ceilings, behind the showers. You know, when I was in Big Sandy, we had a dude, Luke, that specifically was the knife maker. He was from Minnesota and some of the homies used him, just keeping it real, some of the homies used him. And they had him you know, ripping stuff out of the kitchen, like out of the ceilings and all that stuff. Then you take this knife and you take that rock or you take the floor in the cell and you just keep going. You keep sharpening. You keep sharpening. And in prison, you know, most of the time there's nothing to do and all day to do it. And prisoners are pretty innovative people. I've been around dudes. I used to say, man, dudes like MacGyver. Those of you that are older probably know who MacGyver is. He can make anything, do anything. So you get dudes that do that. And then sometimes they would take their time and just sharpen the sides, right? You just sharpen the sides, sharpen the sides. It becomes a pretty menacing weapon, man. And this here is just an old t-shirt, old wife beater, white wife beater. You wrap it around so you can grip it. You might want to know what the string is. That's the lanyard. It's tied onto the knife. Put it on your wrist and it's on your wrist so that when you're stabbing, if it slips out of your hand, it's not gone. You know, I've seen guys and Knife fights in prison, man. It's not a fun thing. It's not, it's not something that you want to do. And, you know, I could talk about this incident at USP Big Sandy. There was a sack dude named Joe. Big Joe. He was a soldier of Aryan culture gang member, along with, you know, a dude named Danny that was an armed gang member at the time, Aryan resistance militia. And, you know, there was a beef or whatever. And I, talk, I think I talk about this in the book. I don't think I cut this out of my book. And they had stabbed this kid, John Boy. And I remember him telling me that he had stabbed him with a piece of steel just like this. He said, man, he thought it was cool. He said, man, when I seen him in the hole, he said, man, that thing went right in, man. It went right in like butter, man. I couldn't even believe it. And I was just like, damn, man. Like, dude didn't even care. Like, he thought it was cool to just go ahead and stab this dude with a piece of steel. Something like this. Pretty menacing, right? There's all kinds of weapons in prison. Like I said, you know. You know, you heard about the lock on the sock. You heard about that, right? And I've seen a dude hit with a lock on a sock. I've seen it a few times. And I think I can honestly say, I mean, I don't want to be stabbed or hit with a lock, but I think I can honestly say that I'd rather be hit with a lock. I mean, I'd rather be stabbed than hit with a lock. I apologize. Because, man, when you see someone get hit with a lock, 
It opens them wide open. And you've heard the thing about the sock, right? So some people might think you take the lock. Here's, here's the padlocks. They sell these in prison to us, right? Even though they don't mean anything, dudes break these two if they want to steal. Most of the time, they don't steal in a penitentiary, but when you get the lower security levels, they're sneak thieving. So anyway, you hear the lock in the sock, but I've seen dudes put locks in a sock, try to hit a guy, and, you know, the sock stretches out, and the, the lock's so heavy, and they're swinging with such force, I've seen the lock fly out, fly right out of the sock. I've seen that in Youngstown, Ohio, when I was in the CCA there. So now with the belts, what you do with the belt is you take the lock and you put it on the belt. You string it through, right? So we would string this through a belt. And then you would tie it. You tie the belt. And they tie that on there. You tie that on there nice and tight, right? But why? Because once it's tied on there, it's not on a sock, it's not going to fly out. And if you hit someone with this thing, I'm talking about really just whack them like, I mean, that's just a light whack. Imagine if someone's swinging at you full force, and sometimes you get guys that get them real low. They'll grab it real low, grab that belt low, and I'm telling you, man, when they hit you with this, they're putting in that work. This is a dangerous weapon in prison. Dangerous, 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 dangerous. You do not want to get hit with a lock. It splits you wide open, man. I promise you, wide, wide open. You know, when I was in the penitentiary, I was in USP Lee. And in Lee, we had these vents in our rooms. You can move the vent. And they had these pieces of steel in there so you can move your vent however you wanted to blow. You could close it so the air wouldn't blow on you or move it so it wouldn't blow on you directly. And there was an incident, I believe it was on Christmas Eve. It was either Thanksgiving or Christmas. I think it was Christmas morning, actually. And there was a dude from Florida. He had dreads. He was running the poker table. And he started beefing with uh, this Jamaican kid. Jamaican kid and him were beefing over the poker game. Dude was running the poker game. He was drinking. And the kid from, the Jamaican kid was from D.C. His co-defendant was there with him, too. And they were arguing. So dude jumps up. He jumps up with the dreads, shakes his hair out. And the D.C. kid, the Jamaican kid, he starts hitting this dude. I'm talking about, man, this kid with the dreads from Florida, man, he was beating the shit out of this dude. Like, literally, just pounding this dude out. And out of nowhere, this dude pulls a knife out of his hair. He used to hide his knife in his dreads. So now he's chasing the D.C. kid. And the D.C. kid, the Jamaican kid, he's kind of out of breath, right? And he's got a chair now. He's trying to fend the dude off. And that's when I see his homeboy, his co-defendant from D.C., Little dude that was in my unit, nice and quiet. Never really bothered nobody. And those are the dudes you better watch out for, them quiet dudes. He comes flying across the floor. Right when his co this is his co-defendant is getting attacked. He comes flying out of the cell. And he's got a piece of metal that looks like this, man. Now tell me that ain't menacing, right? I didn't put a wrap and a strap on it, but he gets a piece of metal like this. And his co-defendant falls on the floor. And the dude with the dreads with the knife, he's close. He's close. He's on top of him, getting ready to stab him. And I see this kid come out of nowhere. And he hits him with that piece of metal that came out of that vent. And he hits him like a machine gun. Bang, 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 bang. I'm telling you, man, blood everywhere. He had to hit this dude, man, 30, 40 times. And it was crazy how he did it because it's like he was running after him and he tripped and slid on the floor on his khakis and got right to the dude right at the right time and just started stabbing the dude with the dreads. Vicious, man. Vicious. You know, I've seen this stuff. i experienced this stuff. Could you imagine getting stabbed with something like that? I mean, that happens, man. Stuff like that happens. Where do they get this type of metal? They get it all over the place, man. From that vent, from the unicorn, off the back of washer machines. I mean, there's metal everywhere, man. It's easy to get, man. And they get it. They definitely get it. So like I said, man, all kinds of weapons. And I've seen people with bow and arrows, dart guns. <laughs> the dart guns are just outrageous, right? And a lot of people know probably like in New York City, in the New York City prison system, some people get cut on the face with razor blades, right? You see that razor blade? And in prison, man, a lot of times they'll wrap them up with black electrical tape. And for some reason, that black electrical tape stops you from uh, going off. 
in the metal detector. And you know, I used to have a razor blade. I kept a razor blade, man, when I got to uh, Raybrook. I didn't want to carry a knife because I was now in an FCI, so I quit carrying a knife. But I felt like I needed some kind of weapon because things were happening, so I always wanted to have this. You know, these are easier to hide. You can hide, man. People hide them in their butt cheeks, man. You can hide them in your pants. A lot of people hide these in their mouth. You can put a razor blade right in your mouth. I could probably put this razor blade in my mouth and talk to the cop and he would never know. You just talk. And you never even know that I got it. Some guys can just spit those right out of their mouth. A lot of New York City guys, they spit them right out of their mouth, right into their hand, and they'll cut you right in the face. That's where that term buck 50 came from, right? People getting cut with razor blades in their face. So razor blade is a dangerous weapon, man, in prison. And if you've ever seen someone get cut with a razor blade, you know, it's just a cut. But the first thing that people do when they get cut, 99% of the time, they'll grab their face. And that's when it all goes bad. Oh, shit. They touch their face and they look at the blood. And it's almost like when they touch their face, they open it. It's like an opening. I've seen people, man, get hit with razor blades and touch their face and just panic, man. Dangerous, dangerous weapons. Dangerous, man. You know, a lot of times you just put the razor blade in your mouth. Keep it on the side. Pull it out. Spit it out. I mean, you can cut people with this, man. and Pretty much it ends the fight, man. I've seen dudes get cut with razor blades and turn into just completely different dudes, man. You don't want to get cut in the face with a razor blade. And then what else, man? What else do we got? <laughs> you probably think this is crazy, man. Where the hell would someone get something like this? A piece of steel pipe. Like I said, Unicor program, out of the maintenance shop. How the hell do they get this shit back? They got metal detectors. How do they get this stuff back into the unit? How? Well, a lot of times the metal detectors aren't even on. And when they are, there's no cop over there manning them. Or sometimes they'll come with their work carts and they'll have, you know, stuff on their work cart. Come right into the unit, drop it off, go back to work. I mean, prisoners are innovative, like I said. You know, also plastic. You know, I've seen dudes melt shampoo bottles down. You melt the plastic, you mold the plastic, you put it in cold water, boom, it freezes. You sharpen it up to a point, and there you go. You got a, uh, you got a plastic knife, and a plastic knife can go pretty much anywhere. One of my first knives in Big Sandy was a plastic knife. It was a knife that was made out of the lights. We had, you know, big square fluorescent lights. And uh, they used to pull the plastic out of there. They pull the plastic out of there. You can sharpen it with a buffer. You can sharpen it on the ground. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do, right? And now let's look at this. I want to show you something. This is just a basic piece of metal, right? And I grabbed this because it, was, it reminded me of something that you might see. You might actually see this like on a uh, back of a wash machine or something. And I've seen knives like this. And you just rip that steel off of there, take it back to your cell. You get out that rock, and once again, you start sharpening. You start sharpening. And you turn this into a killing machine, man. Killing machine. They become killing machines when they get in people's hands. And I've seen people killed. I've seen people murdered in prison, man. And let me tell you, it's not a, it's not a pretty sight. You know, you see your first murderer in prison, you're like, damn, man. Wow, that could be me. That could be me getting murdered. It could be one of my friends getting murdered. You don't want to be that dude, man. I promise you that. You don't want to be the dude that you're like, man, I got to carry a knife to make sure that I'm safe, man. You got to carry a knife in case someone tries to stab you. So you want to protect yourself. But what happens if, you know, something happens and you kill them? What happens if you go to prison with 10 years and you have to kill somebody and now you end up with a life sentence? Trust me, those things happen. You know, I've seen a lot of things happen over nonsense, man. Over small things. Gambling over one dollar. I've seen people stab. I've seen a riot jump off over one dollar at a dice game. I've seen fights over, believe it or not, praying mantises. What? Praying mantises? What the hell are you talking about, Chad? Man, they used to fight praying mantises in USP Lee. They used to catch these praying mantises and make them fight each other. Some of these dudes had these praying mantises like they were their pit bulls. And I've seen dudes, you know, get their praying mantis tore up and they end up fighting. They get angry. That praying mantis is like their friend. Of course, they make it seem like it was over the money or 
dude did something wrong, but really, man, I've seen dudes get bent out of shape about their praying mantis getting killed. Yeah, wild shit, man. Wild shit. People in prison, man, live for reasons to hurt people. At least that's how I used to see it. I used to say, man, some of these dudes are just so angry, so miserable, so alone, so lost, that they look for reasons to do bad things to people, man. And we're going to talk about that on the video, man, with the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. We're going to talk about that. So what do you think, man? What do you think about those weapons, man? What do you think that feels like, man, to be stabbed by something like that? To have something like that stabbed through your stomach or stabbed through your neck? Imagine that going through your neck. That's going to go all the way through. Kill you, man. Kill you in a minute. Getting stabbed with, you know, like the little thing I showed you right here. Well, not little, but imagine that. Getting stabbed in the eye. We're going to talk about that too, man. We're going to talk about a dirty white boy gang member that was stabbed in Big Sand. He was stabbed in his eyes, man. They stabbed the dude's eyes. One dude held him down and he just screamed. While another dude stabbed him in the face. Stabbed him right in the eyes, man. I think that was Mikey Eck. Some of the homeboys that are watching the video, you probably remember that in Big Sandy, 2008. Stabbed Mikey Eck in the face. Kid 7. Motorcycle gang dude. Turned out. He wasn't the best of dudes. Johnny, I think it was the dude's name was Johnny Lee from Florida. He was the one that stabbed the dude's eyes out because he didn't want to go back to Florida. He had a state case for rape. No one knew. So he decided, man, he's going to stab this dirty white boy gang member. He's going to stab his eyes out and get a new charge so he can stay in the feds. He didn't want to have to go over there and serve that rape case time. I mean, shit is real, man. Imagine getting stabbed in the eye and another guy's holding you and there's nothing you can do. Think about it, man. Take a second. Think about it. And dude's stabbing you for, let's say, 20 seconds, 30 seconds before anyone gets there. You want to see how long that is? Let's take 20 seconds and see. That's 20 seconds, folks. Does that seem like a long time? When you say 20 seconds, it don't seem long, but when you have to wait 20 seconds, could you imagine being stabbed for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds? And there's no one there to help you. There's somebody that's tougher than you, stronger than you, holding you on the ground, and you're getting stabbed in the face. For what? Well, I wouldn't do anything to anybody to violate to get stabbed in the face. You might not have to do anything to get stabbed in the face. In federal prison, sometimes people get stabbed for no reason. Sometimes you get stabbed because something happened in another unit between two races. And the people in your unit are ordered to start stabbing all the white dudes. Or all the white dudes are ordered to start stabbing all the Hispanics. Or all the black dudes are ordered to start stabbing the Mexicans. Or the Puerto Ricans are ordered to start stabbing the white dudes. You don't even know what's coming. You don't even know what happened. Next thing you know, you're missing an eye. You don't want to live that life, man. I don't ever want to live that life ever again. I don't ever want to be put in that position. I don't ever want to be put in a position where I could be stabbed or where I have to stab somebody else. I definitely don't want to be there. And you know, I care enough about you, even though I don't know you. I care enough about you to tell you that I don't want you to be stabbed. I don't want you to have to stab anybody. I don't want you to spend your life in a concrete cell, praying and wishing that you could somehow get out. It's up to you, though, man. What life you want to live? You want to change your life? Or you want to go into that dangerous environment where only the strong survive? And sometimes the strong, they don't survive either. Sometimes the strong die. I've seen many strong men die. I've seen many strong men broken. You know, there's stories I can tell you, man, about things about the Aryan Circle when they hit the AB dude in the kitchen. I think they cut him in the face with, you know, razor blade. Cut him in the face with one of them razor blades. And he was a pretty tough dude, but when you got three or four dudes on you, cutting you with a razor blade, he ran and hit under the, try to get under the table to stop himself from being cut in the kitchen. I mean, those are the things that happen in there. You're in a danger zone, man. You're in a concrete jungle. Are you really built like that? 
Even if you are, do you want to live like that? I'm here to tell you that you don't. And I can tell you from experience because I lived that life. I was there, man. I lived that life. I've been stabbed. I've been stabbed in the face. I've been stabbed in the back. I was stabbed here with a what they would call in prison an ice pick. How do they make an ice pick? You ever see them big metal fans? They just took that thing off, the guard, broke it, worked it back and forth, broke it, bent the top over, put the uh, old T-shirt on there, put a lanyard on it, sharpened the point like a nail, like a big old roofing nail. And they stabbed me in the face. I could have lost my eye, man. I don't want you to be that dude. I hope you like the video, man. But I hope it touches home. I hope it makes you think about the decisions that you're making. I hope it gives you motivation, man, to change your life and realize who you really are. Realize, man, that you can accomplish good things, that you don't have to be a drug dealer. You don't have to be a robber. You don't have to do any of that shit, man. You don't have to carjack people. You don't have to kill people over nonsense, over someone talking shit to you on Facebook or over a chick. You don't have to do any of that stuff, man. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow. I'm out.